Hello and welcome to the webinar entitled Mellon Medley Organic Production Practices, Microbial Safety and Consumer Preferences of Various Melon Varieties. This is your host, Alice Formiga from eOrganic at extension.org. All eOrganic webinars, as well as many other resources on organic farming and research are archived on our website at extension.org slash organic underscore production, as well as on the eOrganic YouTube channel. The presentation will last about 45 minutes, and then we'll have about 30 minutes for questions. We'll be reading as many questions out loud as we can after the presentation is over. So before we begin, I'd like to introduce today's speakers. Kate Everts is a professor and extension specialist at the University of Maryland Lower Eastern Shore Research and Education Center. She conducts research on the management of vegetable diseases that are economically important in the Mid-Atlantic region. Currently, her lab focuses on the soil-borne diseases fusarium wilt on watermelon and white mold on lima bean, as well as fusarium fruit rot on melon and the foliar diseases cucurbit downy mildew and powdery mildew. Dr. Shirley McAuliffe is an associate professor in microbial ecology and safety of pre fresh produce at the University of Maryland in College Park. Her work focuses on foodborne pathogens, environmental factors, and agricultural practices that affect pathogen fate and dispersal, as well as the interaction of human pathogens with plants. Both speakers are members of a National NIFA Organic Transitions Grant research project on organic melon production. So thank you for joining us today, Kate and Shirley. And now I am going to hand over the screen controls to Kate, who will be our first presenter. All right, thank you. Um, I just want to mention too that in addition to Shirley and myself um, on the uh, NIFA Organic Transitions Grant that we conducted, um, also our co-investigators uh, were Jerry Brust and Sunny Luau, um, who focused on uh, several aspects of this grant. And you, even though they won't be speaking here, you will see a lot of the outcomes of their research as we talk through this. So what I'm going to do is talk first about the background and initiation of this grant and how we uh, came up with the idea and, and what we hope to accomplish. And then I'm going to focus mostly on field procedures and plant disease management. And then about halfway through, I will hand it on over to Shirley, and she's going to talk about the food safety aspects and um, food quality and um, uh, take us to the end to the question and answer period. So let me get started. We have um, a lot of information to go over. So we began this project um, after observing a trend that was going on in the mid-Atlantic um, in terms of melon production. And I just want to show you that we have been, you you may not know this about us, but um, if you look at this little section of the uh, map here, you can see the mid-Atlantic region. Uh, oops, can we go back a second? I'm not sure why it advanced. There we go. Um, okay, so you can see this is a heat map showing you the area, um, the, the darker red um, from orange going to red are counties in the United States that have um, relatively high production of cantaloupes. This is a map from 2012 from the USDA Ag Census. And you'll see that orange spot in the mid-Atlantic is actually um, here on the Delmarva Peninsula where we conducted our work um, and surrounding it are several yellow counties. So it shows that we are actually, even in 2012, we are a relatively high producer of cantaloupes. The, the graph at the left shows you though the reduction over time. So you can see this graph goes from 1992 to 2011 and it shows you how our melon production, musk melon production in Maryland has decreased from a relatively high level down to um, 2011 where it's decreased about 60 percent and um, so even though we still are a relatively large producer when you compare us nationally um, our production has been reduced over time and so we're we we like the crop we think it's a great crop and um, through talking with growers we asked them you know uh, why the production was decreasing and of course there's there's market um, and um, Competi market competition issues that are involved with the reduction in the um, overall melon 
uh, acreage that we have in the region, but there's also other re uh, reasons that we felt we could work on locally. Um, they often will mention to us that they feel uh, that, that especially organic growers, as they transition to organic production, they see an increase in um, production issues, like especially vegetable diseases, and that these also uh, um, persist as they grow their melons under um, organic practices, even over the long period or long term. And we wanted to see if there were some things, some you know, tactics and strategies that could be used that could reduce that disease pressure. And another thing that they talked about is the concerns about food safety um, and how that could impact their production systems. So Shirley, if you want to make some comments yeah. about this. Yes, sorry, I was unmuting. Thanks, Kate. Yeah, unfortunately, melons are considered a high risk group from a food safety perspective. Um, foodborne illness outbreaks and recalls occur at a relatively high rate for this fruit compared to other fruits. And this slide actually shows data compiled uh, by the CDC that spans uh, from 1973 to 2011. And um, it's showing two things. It's showing outbreak number of outbreaks over time um, as a result uh, associated with cantaloupes, watermelon, and honeydew. Those are the bar graphs that you see along the bottom. And then the line graphs are showing you um, consumption of cantaloupe and watermelon. You can see that there are actually 34 outbreaks um, encompassed in this slide. And it really translates into a high number of illnesses, over 3,600 illnesses, over 300 hospitalizations, and close to 50 deaths associated with consumption of contaminated melons. And cantaloupe really take kind of, the, they're the ones that are most implicated. They, the about 56% of the outbreaks that were reported by, um, um, recorded by the CDC were due to cantaloupe. On the other hand, honeydew, which you can see is just one bar over here, only um, was associated with two outbreaks. So there's a difference in melon type versus how frequently they are associated with uh, foodborne illness. The other thing to note is that there's an increase of uh, reported outbreaks over time. This could be due to increased consumption, but also probably is due to much better reporting um, post 19, mid 1990s or so, and also um, much better surveillance and our methods have improved tremendously when it comes to identifying uh, foodborne illness and associating them with specific outbreaks. And I guess the last point um, that I can make is that salmonella tends to be the organism, the microorganism, the pathogen that is most frequently associated with melons. Um, over 50% of the outbreaks that you see on this chart were due to um, salmonellosis disease. And, and uh, one other thing I can say actually is that when it is possible to trace back the contamination, um, frequently it's traced back to early on in the production um, of, the, of melons. So during growth or harvesting or potentially packaging of these melons. So there's certainly a need to understand how to prevent contamination because this is one very solid way of bringing down these, these um, outbreaks and these illnesses. You can move forward, Kate. All right, thanks, Shirley. So um, at the same time as we were seeing the, as we you know are observing this reduction in melon acreage, we know that the, uh, the number of uh, small specialty um, farms that specialize in vegetable production, including organic and maybe even driven by organic production, um, is increasing. So over from 2008 to 2014, we know that there's been there was a 20 small specialty vegetable crop operations in, in the Mid Atlantic region, and um, we feel that they're ideally suited for production of melons um, as one of the uh, crops that they have in their mix and. Uh, another issue that I didn't mention that growers um, often mentioned as as driving the reduction in production is that um, larger operations have problems with uh, labor, a good steady labor force, because this crop has to be harvested um, very frequently in order to get the melons at the peak level of ripeness. And um, small specialty crops have 
maybe a little bit less problem in that area because they may have family members or um, uh, organic farms may have um, interns, summer interns, student interns that uh, they can rely on for, for that labor force. So a couple of the things that we were interested in was looking at a, an, a production system that would minimize press pressure uh, but be conducive and uh, available for organic farmers. And I, I'm not going to talk a lot about it, but I do want to mention that one of the first things that we tried was to um, have cover crops in a no-till system, and that's this picture on the left. You can see our melons. Whoops. I think when I click on here. Okay, so you can see the, the transplants here down our um, uh, drip, drip line. We at the farms that we worked at were never able to um, get a good kill in a no-till system of our um, cover crops in the spring. And it, it had to do with the equipment that we have available to us. So I think that, you know, if a, a farmer had better equipment maybe, um, they might be able to get on the cover crop in, in the um, uh, spring of the year, but we were never able to, and so we always saw this regrowth. You can see here, um, regrowth of the cover crop, and it competed a lot with our uh, melons, and as a result, the quality of the melons was low. The, the melons that were produced on this no-till system tended to be very late, um, and our yields were reduced, and so we didn't pursue this production system to the end. Instead, we went to a, um, a system where we used these cover crops as a green manure to, um, and, to, and were able to till them into the soil in the spring. Um, and again, we could do this under the organic um, practices and were much more successful. And so that is the data that I'm going to present to you. Um, so along with trying to find a system that would work, in uh, producing organic, we were also then focused on for how to um, reduce this increase in disease pressure that growers see during the transition period. So how to suppress disease. So the diseases that we typically see, um, foliar diseases in our region, um, are shown here on the slide. This is Circospora leaf spot. You can see the dark halos of the lesions here with a little bit lighter center. This disease, actually, I think this disease, it's considered a more southern, more tropical disease, but we're seeing this more and more um, within the mid-Atlantic region. But um, I'm not going to talk too much about it in terms of the practices that we use because it tends to come in early in the season and then it gets overwhelmed by some of these other um, diseases that have been much longer term um, problems here in our region. So the second disease and one that I will show you some data on is anthracnose um, caused, caused by Colototricum. This disease causes these angular brown lesions and when the lesions um, progress you can see this the torn areas at the center of the lesion. We also typically get powdery mildew. This may be our most common disease on a susceptible variety, you see the white sporulation here on the upper surface of the leaf. It also will sporulate on the lower surface of the leaf as well um, and cause a lot of damage. Downy mildew is another disease that we see very frequently, not every year, but very frequently. And that uh, looks like th this picture where you can see these angular square lesions. Um, if you flip the leaf over, if you flip the leaf over, you can see this downy sporulation here, as you see here, um, on the underside of the leaf. So downy mildew is also a very severe problem, causing a lot of yield loss. In so some of the strategies that we we're interested in looking at um, were cover crops, um, because we know that cover crops can reduce disease or suppress disease um, in certain pathosystems and we've had some success with that. We also want to look at cultivar resistance. I'll just show you a little vid video clip of our uh, our cover crops here. This would have been just prior to um, tilling them under in the spring. 
We also looked at host resistance or cultivar or variety resistance um, to see the difference in, in, really in this case, it would have been more the difference in susceptibilities among the melon types probably. And um, finally, we also looked at biorational fungicides to see how they might also be used in combination with other practices to suppress diseases. And the, the products that we looked at, again, were all things that had an OMRI, uh, um, that were on the OMRI list so that if your certifier was in agreement, would be something that you might be able to use on an organic farm. So let me show you what we did. Um, so you can kind of get a feel for how the uh, field looked and, and um, what our practices were. This was an organic transitions grant that we were working under. So we had um, fields that were, we had um, one field that was a transitional field and one field that was an organic field. The farm that I'm going to talk about first was located here in Salisbury, Maryland, which is on the eastern shore of Maryland. To get so I know that there are many of you who are in different parts of the country. So to just get you oriented, this is Washington, D.C. here. This would be Annapolis. Here's the Chesapeake Bay. So if you go across our big bay bridge onto the eastern shore, this is actually the, air, the um, prime agricultural uh, land that we have for vegetable project, production in Maryland. This little square here is the state of Delaware. Um, we have many farmers that farm land in both states, both Maryland and Delaware. This is a, a picture of our farm and it's got an overlay of the uh, soil type from the NRCS. I want to show you the two fields that I'll be talking about. This field is our organic transition field. So this field had been farmed for more than 20 years, many more than 20 years as a conventional field when we started our project. Primarily, it had had corn and soybeans in it. It has a um, fairly low pH, which is typical of our, our farm, um, 5.9. Uh, it's loamy sand, a Fort Mott loamy sand with a very low organic matter content. We, we are kind of sitting on a sandbar here. Um, our soils are very, very sandy. Our organic land on this farm, this is the University of Maryland's um, Lower Eastern Shore Research Farm. Our organic land, we have some land that's dedicated to organic research, and it's here at the back part of our farm. Um, this land had been in organic practices for 11 years. It had a history of vegetable production, primarily in that 11 that it was mixed with field crops and vegetable crops. Um, it had a little bit higher pH, 6.8. Um, the organic matter level also still very low, only uh, still less than 1%. And this had a mix of Fort Mott loamy sand and Rosedale loamy sand. So again, very sand, uh, sandy part um, of the US. I want to mention this is Dr. Sasha Marine. She worked on this project as a postdoc for, th for three years um, and now is at Virginia Tech. But um, I have to acknowledge her because she really led the uh, field aspects and the disease um, evaluations under this project. So what we did was crops, they were sown in the fall um, with a grain drill. And then we briefly watered them because of our sandy soils to get them established. But then after um, managed aggressively during the winter time at all. Um, in the spring then we tilled with a moldboard type plow to incorporate biomass into the soil. And um, we did apply a field. And we did that because uh, if you remember, the pH in that soil was, was fairly low. And we have a problem here with our melons in that if our pH drops uh, too much and, become, and the soil becomes too acidic, we have manganese toxicity. So we were trying to avoid that. Um, but the, uh, pol the pelletized poultry manure that we used was, um, again, it had an OMRI. It was OMRI listed. Um, and, uh, so it was um, acceptable for us to use. The, we 
uh, used three single cover crop species and two legume grass cover crop mixtures in the first year, and then the second year we focused in on uh, some of our better treatments. The uh, seeding rate that we had, the hairy vetch, we, we, um, we used 40 pounds per acre. Crimson clover, we used at 20 pounds per acre. The rye, we used at 70 pounds per acre. And then we had a two to three mix of the hairy vetch and rye um, at 20 pounds per acre hairy vetch and 30 pounds per acre rye. And then a two to one mix of the crimson clover rye at 20 pounds of crimson clover and 10 pounds of rye. In the second year of the study, we ended up dropping out our two uh, hairy vetch treatments. We wanted to focus in our efforts so that we could take more data on the treatments that we had. And so we actually decided to drop the hairy vetch treatments based on feedback that we got from our local farmers. They're very um, reluctant to use hairy vetch because of issues with um, hard seed and having it come back as a weed and um, small grains, especially um, our, some of our organic growers are very concerned because they don't have a herbicide that they can go in and, and take it out with. So, so the second year we did drop the hairy vetch. I like hairy vetch, but we decided to drop that and focus in on our crimson clover treatments, which really gave us um, similar results as you will see to the hairy vetch. This uh, information I put in after some feedback from Alice that a lot of times questions on these uh, webinars revolve around we get our, um, our inputs from. So I just wanted to uh, show this quickly. Um, we bought our, our cover crop seed from Johnny's, uh, Selected Seeds, Territorial Seed Company, High Mowing Seed, um, Fedco, and then for our legume cover crops, we used a um, inoculant Endure from Intex Microbials in North Carolina, and it also was OMRI listed. And the um, cover crop seed was um, organic cover crop seed. Our melons, we uh, purchased from high mowing organic seed for this particular trial. Um, and we use, as I mentioned, we use the pell pelletized poultry um, litter microstart from Peru AgriCycle um, out of Seaford, Delaware. So I'm not going to talk a lot about yield because our goal was really to focus on the plant diseases, um, human pathogens, and some other issues that growers were seeing. But we did, of course, take yield. And um, just to reconfirm some things that have been shown in, in research previously, our cover crops um, did impact yield. This, this just shows you a very brief summary of um, uh, the average fruit yield or the average fruit weight um, from both our 2015 and 2016 years. You can see both of our fields. This is our organic field. This is our transitional field in 2015 and likewise our organic and transitional field in 2016. Um, what we saw was that our legal crops improved the average fruit yield, um, either either there was a trend or it was significantly so in both years. So in 2015, hairy vetch significantly improved our average fruit weight um, compared to rye and bare ground. Um, and the, the other treatments that had a legume in it, the crimson clover or the mixed ones also, um, they fell in the middle. Uh, in the in 2016, we saw the same thing, only it was even more pronounced. So that year was the year we had just the crimson clover and the crimson clover mix, along with Ryan Bear Ground, and uh, the crimson clover alone and the crimson clover plus rye cover crop mix uh, significantly improved our fruit weight over the bare ground and the rye. We didn't see the same response in the transitional field, but that's probably because that was the field where we used that pelletized poultry manure microstart, and it probably masked any kind of benefit that we were getting from the um, legume cover crop. So really what I want to focus on is what the impacts of these inputs were on disease level. And this is a slide really to kind of uh, just serve as a backdrop for me to tell you overall what we saw in terms of cover crops. 
Um, there's lots of reasons why people use cover crops. They're hugely beneficial in terms of ecosystem services in many, many ways. And um, we, we like them for the aspects of uh, improving soil health and even suppressing some soil-borne diseases. But in this trial, for the diseases that we were observing um, in our fields, we did not see any uh, significant impacts of the cover crops in suppression of disease. So what this graph means, this statistic here, this p-value, indicates that this was not significant. So even though you can look at this and say, oh, it almost looks like there might be some differences between crimson clover, say, and rye, this is telling us that there was enough variability across the field that we really weren't, we can't be, we, we really weren't seeing anything. Same in the, whoops, that was a tra transitional field. So even in the transitional field, we were seeing the same thing. This is telling us that there's really no significant differences. So that means that, that um, if so for this, this particular um, metric that we were looking at, the uh, severity of anthracnose on this particular date, July 30th, 2016, there's no significant difference, but that was really uh, common, the common um, result of what we were seeing. So these diseases are neither made worse by the cover crop, nor were these particular diseases made better. But again, I want to emphasize that there's a whole suite of reasons why you would want to use a cover crop. And, and this data to me doesn't say that you shouldn't use a cover crop. What this data says to me is that you shouldn't rely on the cover crop to suppress the diseases that we saw in this field. And the diseases that we saw, again, were anthracnose, powdery mildew, and downy mildew. So use a cover crop for all the wonderful benefits that it can provide you. But then in terms of disease suppression for those diseases, um, look for other tactics. And so the other tactics that, are, that we looked at, again, were to look at cultivar or host resistance, and then to look at biorational fungicides. So the first one that I'll talk about is our cultivar or host resistance. And um, we had eight cultivars, and they could be broken down into four groups. We had Athena and Edom's Jam, which were muskmelon types. We had two honeydews, Dulcy Nectar and Snow Mass. Um, Escorial and Sivan are the Sharon Thai types, and Juan and Sunbeam were canary types. You can see they all had very different rinds, and I think Shirley will come back to that later on when she talks about food safety. Um, I don't want to belabor this too much, but we looked at these eight different melons, um, four different melon types, and uh, I think that one of the conclusions were there was no single cultivar that performed um, outstanding when, um, when it was challenged with any of the particular diseases we had. Again, anthracnose, powdery mildew, and downy mildew. Um, however, there were some that did show nice, um, maybe lower susceptibility of some diseases. So for instance, Sivan actually looked pretty good when we looked at it for anthracnose, and it looked very nice when we looked at it for downy mildew. However, in powdery mildew, it was kind of uh, middle of the road, not very exciting. But there were other cultivars that perform better for powdery mildew. So Athena and Dulce Nectar looked really nice. So I think uh, here what we can conclude is that if you're, if you're able to maybe um, select some cultivars that have um, an, a nice uh, level of maybe reduced susceptibility to some diseases and other varieties that maybe have reduced susceptibility to other diseases, use those in combination with the thing I'm going to talk about next, which is the bio-rational fungicides, um, so that you can suppress diseases over the season. So the, um, the last aspect I want to talk about before I hand this over to Shirley is um, the bio-rational pro products that we used. There were four bio-rational products and that we use. Some of these were biological, some were not. Um, Actinovate is a, um, um, its active ingredient is a uh, Streptomyces species, species, which is a soilborne organism. We looked at Oxidate, we looked at Regalia, which actually is a, a plant 
has pla a plant extract as its active ingredient. Serenade, Serenade has a bacillus species as the active ingredient, again, a, so a beneficial soil-borne organism. And then we looked at a um, copper that had an, that was armory listed. The first we looked at CHAMP. We didn't like CHAMP. This is a picture of some of my students in the field uh, spraying this copper on. So the, uh, and the reason why was because it just didn't go into solution very well for us with this backpack sprayer that wasn't getting a lot of agitation. So we switched to Quava the second year and had a little bit better luck. Um, and we were spraying on a seven-day schedule, and so um, we were comparing um, the copper on a seven-day schedule to these biorational products um, alternated with the copper. So this would be sprayed one week and then the copper the next week. So what we found again was there's no silver bullet. Um, some products looked better for, for downy mildew and others look better for powdery mildew. Um, Serenade looked in the first year, looked um, nice on downy mildew. Um, it, it significantly reduced downy mildew compared to the untreated plots. Um, we had some treatments that were kind of intermediate Actinovate, Oxidate, Regalia all, all looked okay, um, not quite as good as the Serenade Champ alternation. Um, for powder, oh, and I should mention downy mildew was very low the second year, so we couldn't make any conclusions about that. Powdery mildew was a little bit different um, situation. The first year, our, our powdery mildew pressure was a little bit lower, so we had relatively more things that uh, uh, performed well. So Oxidate, Regalia, or Serenade alternated with, with um, our copper product or the copper product alone both, both performed well the first year. The second year where we had a little bit higher disease pressure, um, the, the products I mentioned that performed well the first year, they were sort of intermediate um, and the best product was our, our seven day copper um, product which um, was really the one we were trying to get away from because we we would like to be using less copper if at all possible. Um, but the um, um, before we switch over and talk about the next aspect, I would just say that you know this gives this is another example and gives another tool that that could be used to try to suppress diseases in the in an organic melon production system. And with that, I'll switch over. But surely talk a little the aspects. So the next next we're going to discuss the food safety component and also towards the end I'll talk a little bit about the food quality uh, component that we had for this project. That was conducted by uh, Dr. Sunny Luo and Yuhi Park at uh, USDA. But the food safety work was conducted at the University of Maryland um, and at the research site. Okay, so the first um, thing was to assess. One thing that we were interested in was not simply um, working on melons directly, but also to assess the impact of using um, cover crops and green manures on the persistence of bacteria that would be relevant to food safety. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Our main goal here was to compare a number of different uh, cover crops and look at how those cover crops may impact persistence of bacteria, um, indicator bacteria. The second objective was to determine whether the green manure that we were going to produce from those cover crops would impact the dispersal of bacteria in soil onto melon fruit. So I'll give you some data on those trials as well. And then the third was to look at the different cultivars and determine whether uh, different cultivars exhibited uh, differential susceptibilities to colonization with human foodborne pathogens. And that uh, work was conducted in the lab at College Park, here at the University of Maryland College Park, with on melons that were grown in the field on the system that Kate was talking about. Okay, and then towards the end, I'll um, get into a little bit the melon quality and also data from the com consumer panels that we conducted at USDA. Right, so um, Kate already discussed it, but I wanted to kind of, I guess, to refresh your memories. We, we conducted the um, 
cover crop bacterial aspect of the project over two years. The first year we had um, the organic field only, and we looked at we had hairy vetch and rye and hairy vetch rye combination. So we had the two single species cover crops and then the combination of those and bare ground as our as our control kind of. And then the second year we added on the transitional field as well, as well as added on the crimson clover. We still did the rye, so we had the hairy vetch, the rye, and the crimson clover single species cover crop plots, and then a combination of those with rye. Again, background is the control. And here you can see in the picture is the organic field with, with you can see in the background and some other cover crops there. Okay, so um, we we wanted to look at two specific indicator organisms. The first one that we chose was E. coli. This is um, generic E. coli, not the pathogenic E. coli that causes disease, but the generic E. coli that can, that can serve as an indicator um, for other for human pathogens. Of course, we couldn't use human pathogens in the field, so we had to find non-pathogenic strains. And the second organism that we worked with was Listeria inocua, um, which again is a non-pathogenic species of Listeria, but behaves very similarly to pathogenic Listeria species, such as Listeria monocytogenes. Um, we did test our soil for these two organisms before we started, and we didn't find any listeria at all. And we did find very sporadic and very low levels of E. coli here and there, which we thought would not impact our results. So we went ahead and um, um, inoculated our field. So um, you can see in the picture here is uh, Dr. Niana Reed Jones, who was a postdoc who did the microbiological work that I'll be talking about right now. You can see her. In the picture, mixing the, the bacterial cocktail just prior to field inoculation. And then you can see Kate there driving the ATV, and Sasha is um, inoculating the field. And the way that we did this, again, I can show you a little, I thought I could show you, there we go, a little movie clip. You can see Sasha holding a handheld sprayer with uh, the boom has, has four nozzles. I'm not sure that it's working. It's not working on my computer, but you can see um, Sasha walking along at a very kind of set pace and spraying. You can see the spray, the inoculum, the bacterial inoculum, coming out at a uniform rate for each plot. So we tried to calibrate this as much as possible from plot to plot, and that's how we inoculated this the cover crop to get the E. coli and listeria into the west. Okay, so I'll show you some of the data. So what we, di we did after we inoculated the field is we started collecting soil samples from each plot, from, from all the different cover crop plots and background plots that we had for the for one field or two fields, depending on the year. Um, and like I said, Niana did most of this work in the lab. Um, Sasha was collecting a lot of the samples. And we took these um, soil samples back to the lab to enumerate the bacteria of interest. E. coli and um, Listeria inocua. And what you see here is actually the number of E. coli for the different plots. And what you can instantly see, this is E. coli here on this particular slide. For the first and second year, you can see that we only have the hairy vetch and rye in year one and in year two, adding on the crimson clover and the crimson clover rye combination. The dotted line here denotes the limit of detection for the bacteria that we're looking at. So we're counting E. coli in soil samples over a 31-week period just prior to incorporating it into the soil. And you can see that right from the start, we have a high level of E. coli because we inoculated that level. But as the first few weeks kind of progress on, you can see already a very steep decline of those bacteria um, as we kind of progress into the fall. We did see some lingering of E. coli in the hairy vetch, rye, and um, and the rye plot initially. You can see here at week uh, three and five. With, uh, at week three, we still have some high levels of E. coli in those two plots, but that quickly drops down. And then we didn't really, we couldn't really detect E. coli until the May of the following year. In the second year, we didn't really see that 
differentiation there with the hairy veteran rye, we saw pretty much declines throughout. We did see some more survival of E. coli, but again, once it got really cold, we saw a decline of those uh, bacteria below the detection limit. For Listeria, Listeria is renowned for its um, cold-loving um, abilities. It is able to survive refrigerated temperatures, which is why it's such a dangerous foodborne pathogen. Um, and we see the same out in the field. You can see that even throughout the winter months, we don't really see um, kind of Listeria falling below detection limits. In fact, we see it throughout the, the study. And you can see, again, that we don't really see any um, difference as far as different cover crops go. So when we when we first started this, we really didn't know what the cover crops would, would do um, from a plant pathogen perspective. There are, there are some data that shows that cover crops can suppress certain plant pathogens. We had no idea what the cover crops would do to the human kind of um, indicator bacteria, human pathogen indicator bacteria. We didn't know whether they would suppress or potentially even enhance growth because of the rhizosphere effect that might come from having the rhizospheres in the soil. But what we see here actually is that there really was no difference as compared to the plot. Um, there are some fluctuations uh, at, you know, within certain weeks, but really nothing that we could say was a strong pattern that you can see over the two years. What was much more apparent was the association with temperature for E. coli, not for Listeria, but as you can see, E. coli declined over time as we entered the winter months and then as it got warmer we see some resurgence the following spring with listeria it really didn't matter how cold or warm it was listeria was there in fact we you could even argue that maybe listeria had a bit of a competitive advantage in the winter when most other bacteria were being um you know were knocked out were dormant because of the cold temperature we also looked at rainfall here we go we also looked at rainfall to see whether kind of mo increased moisture in the soil, this is um, for soil again, um, would would have an impact, would, would show some kind of association with the bacterial dynamics, population dynamics, but there was nothing that we could really um, tease out of that. So we didn't think that rainfall was really impacting survival in a significant way. Okay, so so as far as the cover crops and bacterial survival, um, we really didn't see anything that was concerning or certainly not something that you would try to use as a way to suppress foodborne pathogens. So if you, ha if you had the suspicion that there are some foodborne pathogens and pathogens in the soil or if um, after applying manure, for example, raw manure, or if you live in an area that is has some salmonella or other pathogens endemic, then cover crops is certainly not a way to control that. Um, but we didn't know what would happen in terms of green manure, and and we really wanted to follow this through with melon production as well. So the next slide I'll show you, you can see here the plow is tilling in the cover crops in the, in the spring, and we did this twice over a two-week period so that we could really break up that plant material, the wooden amounts of material um, in the soil still kind of decomposing slowly. But we tilled, um, uh, we disked in the, the cover crops to produce this green manure, but then we wanted to see also whether this would impact bacterial survival. And again, we didn't see, with listeria, we didn't really see any difference. We, in fact, saw a dip in listeria numbers after tilling, um, but that quickly kind of recovered uh, four weeks after tillage, and we saw that the numbers kind of remained the same. On the other hand, E. coli, there was a bit of a trend um, an, inc an increase in E. coli numbers, but since this coincided with also the weather getting warmer, we're not sure whether it had to do with green manure or whether it was simply just the temperatures getting warmer, and we saw that um, certainly E. coli was increasing, was resurging when temperatures got warmer. So it, it's hard to kind of tease that information apart, but you can see here that E. coli does tend to increase a little bit after the tillage occurred. Okay, so after um, after that step of kind of 
uh, plowing in the green manure, uh, the, the cover crops to produce green manure, you can see that we transplanted the melons onto raised beds here in the field. You can see this organic field again now having um, melons. And with that, with those melons, we did a lot of things. Um, this picture I wanted to show because I wanted to specify that we didn't really differentiate between melons that ended up growing on the soil or others that were still on the plastic or growing on foliage. You can, as you, can, as you know, um, if you've seen a melon field, the melons really take over and they just kind of crawl all over the place. You can even see some, some melons stuck in the soil. So we really didn't differentiate between melons that were growing on different surfaces. Um, we just collected melons um, more based on their maturity. Right, and here are some pictures of our sampling efforts. This was a tremendous sampling effort these um, summers that we did this. You see in the middle, Maria Teresa is taking soil samples, and to the right is Niana collecting melons to, um, to weigh. And on the left, you see um, that is Louisa. She was an undergraduate in, in my lab cutting out melon discs. Those would be transported to the lab on ice and then we inoculated those with human pathogens to assess the food safety um, kind of susceptibility of those. Okay, so we'll get into some of this data. The first objective I, I'll, uh, the first data I'll show you is for dispersal of E. coli and listeria found in the soil onto melon fruit. So we collected melons, as I said, at, at different stages of growth, so small melons, medium-sized melons, but still not large enough, um, not full size, and then the full size unripe melons, and then the large ripe melons that would be the marketable fruit. We also collected soil samples. And again, with these, we took them back to the lab to determine what were the levels of E. coli on these. So we were comparing, um, this is just one cultivar, it's uh, Sivan, and we were comparing the different cover crops and bare ground as our control. We started out early in the season with undetectable E. coli, as you can see up, up on the top here, no E. coli in the panels here. Um, but then some E. coli kind of showed up later on. And equivalent to that, you can see that very there was a very low level of E. coli on the fruit. And in fact, in this particular trial, we found no significant effect for, of melon size or cover crop. This is the organic field. On the transition, in the transitional field, we had a little higher levels of E. coli that we detected, and in kind of mirroring that, you see a slightly higher rate of dispersion of E. coli onto the onto the fruit. But again, no significant cover crop effect. Although we did notice that we were we were more E. coli from the larger fruit than we did on the smaller fruit. Oh, sorry. Listeria, on the other hand, sorry, I'm flipping through these slides. There's a bit of a lag. Listeria, on the other hand, um, just, you know, once we put it in there, it just wouldn't go away. Again, I want to stress this is non-pathogenic listeria, but it really does extremely well out in the environment, and it loved our field. And you can see that the top panels are showing you listeria in soil. We had very high levels of listeria inocua in the organic field as well as the transitional field. Um, and, and, that, um, and those levels increased over time, and that, that increase was significant. And to reflect that, you can also see that the melon fruit um, had a higher number of listeria as the, you know, as the season progressed. So the larger melons had consistently had uh, listeria on them, although we didn't detect listeria on the smaller size fruit, even though it was present in the soil. There's a similar pattern here for the transitional field. Again, with melon size being a factor, a significant uh, factor, more listeria on the larger melons and on the ripe melons. Um, we also saw more listeria in the soil as the season progressed. We did see here uh, an effect of cover crop. You can see here that bare ground had a higher level of listeria than the rye plots. But if I go back to the previous slide, you'll notice that we saw the opposite. <laughs> in the organic field, a much higher 
level of listeria in the crimson clover and rye plot than in the bare ground. So we don't really think that this is a significant finding. There must have been some other factor that um, may have given this result. In any case, the, the differences are not very big. So as far as dispersion goes, it's pretty clear that if the bacteria are in the soil, it's highly likely that they will get transmitted onto the fruit. OK, so waiting for the slide. Right. So again, here are the melon cultivars that we looked at. Um, many of these Kate already showed, uh, showed pictures of as they were part of the kind of the pest, uh, the uh, disease management studies, we wanted to determine how these different melon cultivars might support the survival or the growth or the colonization of foodborne pathogens. So they're split here by type. Again, we have the muskmelon, Charente, and the Gallia all have a netted rind. We thought this might be a significant um, attribute as far as foodborne pathogen colonization might go because these kind of the netting, the ridges and the nooks and crannies are great for bacteria to get lodged in. And, and we already knew from the CDC data that these types of melons have a, are more, um, more commonly associated with foodborne illness. And then we selected some smooth skin melons. We had the honeydew. Um, we had two cultivars of honeydew and we had uh, the canary type, Jean and some bean. And these are also smooth, but have kind of a coarser skin and, and some ridges. OK, so what we did is we cut those discs out, as I showed you on the previous slide, and we took those back to the lab. Um, we didn't wash the rinds. We kept everything um, kind of intact as it was in the field. So we didn't surface sterilize the rinds. But we inoculated them with either Salmonella Newport, which is uh, stereotype of salmonella that is very commonly found here on the eastern shore in Maryland, Virginia, um, and has caused some outbreaks in the past with, with uh, tomato and even cucumber. We had a listeria monocytogeny strain that we got from the USDA. And then we also had an E. coli 0157H7 um, that is a pathogenic E. coli that is not found associated with melon. It's this pathogen specifically is more commonly associated with um, leafy greens, but we wanted to test it anyway. And what was clear, so I tried to simplify the data bit by categorizing our cultivars into either the canary type, the honeydew type, and the netted type. So each one of these two or three different cultivars. But I think it's pretty clear, uh, very clearly shows that um, the netted types of melons were much more susceptible. It seemed to be they were much more favorable to bacterial growth compared to, uh, in particular, the canary type. So the lowest levels of bacteria recovered were from canary. And the highest levels of bacteria recovered were from netted. And again, these are for the actual human pathogens. OK. Um, uh, later on, in about uh, three years into the study, we recruited a student, Robert Career, who works with Kate and I on a Cesarium Salmonella project. So one of the kind of um, problems that melons face post-harvest here is a fruit rot caused by Cesarium species. And Kate really directs the aspect of his project that has to do with the plant pathogen side, the Cesarium side, um, while I advise him mostly on the, the Salmonella side. So um, she can probably answer questions about the fusarium part um, much more in depth than I can. Um, but here I want to show you the data specifically for salmonella. So we, I, we wanted to see whether infection of melon rinds with, with, with different species of fusarium would impact salmonella colonization and persistence. So we inoculated, you can see the, again, melon discs here in the lab that were first inoculated with uh, Fusarium. And after four days, you can see the infection already beginning to manifest itself after four days of, of that, um, inoculate the, those lesions with Salmonella, and then recover the Salmonella at a later time to see whether 
the, the actual Fusarium infection infected the populations of Salmonella compared to the control, which was a non-infected rind. And again, we did this trial many times for melons that were either grown in the field or grown in a high tunnel. And we have multiple um, trial data from multiple trials. And it's pretty complicated data. So I tried to, um, I'm only showing you some of the trials, but some of, um, I'm trying to show you the represent, kind of representative data. There, are, there is some variation within these, and I'll discuss that a little bit as well. So what's going on here is that we're looking at the different cultivars. Again, these would be netted type, Arava and Athena. Athena is kind of the supermarket variety that you see at the supermarket very commonly. Arava, Athena, and Sivan um, are netted, although Sivan has a little bit less netting than the other two. And then we have a honeydew, Dulce, and a canary type, the Jean. So what you see here is, again, Dulce in this case is showing you lower colonization by Salmonella, but as you follow the, the, the color codes are showing you different species of Fusarium um, that are listed here, um, there really was no effect of Fusarium on Salmonella. You can see from these are CFUs per um, gram of melon rind, and you can see that the, the Rinds that were infected with Fusarium have very similar levels to the rinds that were uninfected, and these are not statistically different. So although the host, the cultivar, had an impact on Salmonella numbers, the infection did not. And these were for melons grown in the field. I'll show you also an example of melons grown in a high tunnel, and we kind of see this a similar thing. Again, some of the cultivars are showing you lower levels of Salmonella, um, but not as a factor of Fusarium infection. Although I should mention, um, going back to that, that in one of our high tunnel trials, we did see significantly lower counts of Salmonella on melons, um, on, on melons that were infected with uh, Fusarium fujikuroi compared to the water control. But this observation was not consistent. Um, in any case, the levels were lower than the water, actually, not higher. So there really was no evidence um, that would suggest that Fusarium increases salmonella growth, which is good news from the you know, food safety perspective, although you don't want Fusarium infection either. OK, so the, the last few minutes, I want to just mention the, the sensory um, evaluation data. Again, this work was conducted in Sunny Luo's lab at the USDA in Beltsville at the food, uh, food Quality Lab. And you can, you can see Sunny in the picture on the right-hand side. And Yunhee Park, who is a food technologist who works in her group, um, conducted a lot of this work. We did two, there two kind of components to this, the physical chemical parameters, which included um, uh, parameters such as the flesh color of the melon, texture, pH, soluble solids, titratable acidity, et cetera. Um, and I should mention that this was done on over two years again for melons that were grown in three different locations. And you can see the cultivars um, are listed below the, the bar charts over there. And what you can see is that Jean and the little set tended to have uh, lower acidity, I'm, I'm sorry, lower pH, higher acidity compared to the kind of netted melons such as Athena and uh, Sunbeam, I'm sorry, Athena and Sivan. Um, the soluble solid content varied a bit. Um, it was more or less uniform, although sometimes the honeydew and canary melons tended to have slightly lower soluble solid content. Okay, and this is data for the consumer preference. So we had, um, as part of the sensor evaluation, a trained and the consumer panel, uh, trained and consumer panel that evaluated 17 different attributes. They're actually listed there on the right-hand side of this slide. Um, and so these sensory attributes, you can see some of them, such as uh, were things like sweetness, uh, veggie flavor, uh, firmness, appearance, um, overall acceptance, etc. So there, there are many different, and the trained panelists are trained to kind of differentiate what what all of these different um, attributes are. 
and how to discern all of that. And what you can clearly see is that when you put all of that data together is that Athena and Sivan uh, clustered together over here versus Jean and Dulce clustered together on the other end of this, um, of this analysis. Um, Athena, as I said, is the supermarket variety, I like to call it, because it's very common. It's kind of our common cantaloupe that, you, that most people are familiar with. So Sivan was actually preferred to Athena in this case. Um, they thought the flavor was better and the overall eating quality was better as well. Conversely, Jean, which is unfortunate for me as a food safety person, because Jean was one of the cultivars that Salmonella least enjoyed, <laughs> um, was also not enjoyed by humans. Unfortunately, Sivan was kind of in the middle as far as uh, food safety risk. Um, so yeah, so Jean was one of the least preferred because of its green flavor and veggie flavor. Not sure exactly what that means, but we can imagine. Okay, so yeah, this is show you kind of putting all of that data together. There's a strong correlation between the overall quality um, and the flavor acceptability. And uh, uh, Sivan performed the best. You can see Sivan is on the outside of that and was very close to Athena as well. And if you recall from Kate's uh, part of the slide of the of the presentation, Sivan also showed pretty good performance in terms of resistance to certain um, diseases in the field. Okay, so I just want to mention that for any of you who might be on the East Coast this summer, we're going to be having a twilight meeting and a field demonstration to talk about some of the some of this work. Uh, we have crimson clover already in the field um, that we planted in the at the end of the summer. And we plan on growing Athena, Sivan, and John in the field and explain some of this work um, hands-on. And we don't have a date for that yet, but it will be some time in probably end of July. Okay, and finally, acknowledgements. We mentioned most of these people. I wanted to mention here Jerry Brust, who Kate mentioned earlier in the, uh, in the beginning of the presentation. I also want to thank um, uh, Mike Newell, who is the farm manager at the Y Research and Education Center, and David Armentrout, who I don't have a picture of, but he's the farm manager at the Lower Eastern Shore Research and Education Center, and everybody else who worked on this project, and NIFA for the funding. And with that, I think we can take some questions. Thank you. Thank you. So now moving on to our questions, um, we got a couple of questions. How many gallons per acre did you use to um, apply the respective treatments um, for powdery mildew, downy mildew, and other diseases that Kate was talking about? Sure. Yes, thanks. So we we actually try to apply almost all of our um, biorational as well as even when we're doing conventional products. We try to apply it in about 45 gallons per acre. So um, I don't know, that's maybe a little bit high, but not as high as I have seen. Um, it's always, you know, part of the question I think is it's always hard to get good coverage of these products and these products tend to be um, contact products um, and it's always a challenge with cucurbit leaves. Something like muskmelon has got a pretty big leaf and so when you're going over the top of it, um, you want enough water so that you're getting pretty good coverage of that leaf um, so that you're coming in contact with the spores better um, to form or forming a barrier so that when the spores are deposited on the leaves you've got you've got good coverage okay um, okay here's some interesting questions about post-harvest handling here is listeria con contamination of soil common as a source of melon infection or is it more often introduced to melons in the pack shed or with post-harvest handling Um, Listeria monocytogenes, which is the kind of the infamous Listeria that causes some severe foodborne illness, is not commonly found in the in the crop production field. Unless you are applying raw cattle manure, then you may find it because it's commonly found in cattle um, feces. Um, you can have biofilms of Listeria becoming very persistent in packing sheds or even processing plants, and that can be a problem. And that's why Listeria is kind of more commonly associated with um, packaging packing houses or processing um, facilities. 
So the, the field contamination is not something that we worry too much about, but it's not impossible, especially if the field has a history of cattle manure application. Okay. Um, from a consumer standpoint, what would be the most effective way of washing netted melons in order to ensure food consumption safety, i.e. should you soak it in water or scrub the outside? What would you recommend? Sorry, did you say consumer perspective? Yeah, from a consumer standpoint. Yes. So, say you have yes. a netted wet melon, what, how should you clean it um, before you eat yes. it? You should definitely scrub it. <laughs> there are, even if even if um, there is no human pathogens, and it, there really shouldn't be any, but even if there aren't, there are still many bacteria on there. Um, so you certainly want to clean it, particularly if you're not going to eat it all in one sitting. Um, when you slice, there is data that shows that when you're slicing through melons, um, you can kind of smear the bacteria that are on the outside onto the flesh of the melon. And so if you're refrigerating part of that, it's likely that you could have carried bacteria in from the outside. And then as you, as I mentioned earlier, there are certain pathogens like Listeria that can actually um, grow at refrigerated temperatures. So if you leave those melon slices in the fridge, the, the Listeria could still grow if it's present. Um, other pathogens such as Salmonella would not tend to grow in the fridge. They're very slow growing at low temperatures. However, if people are immunocompromised or if there are very high levels of salmonella, you could still get uh, foodborne illness that way as well. So definitely wash it off. Um, you know, and if it's a very netted melon, then I, a good scrubber like what you would use for potatoes works very well. Okay, good, good to know. Is the university working at all with respect to breeding to improve cultivar resistance to plant pathogens and foodborne pathogens or the sensory aspects of varieties like Jaune? Um, I can talk a little bit about the cultivar resistance from the plant disease aspect. We actually, because we have been a, um, a very strong uh, melon producing region, had a excellent breeder here for many, many years. Um, Tim Ng, who um, who developed um, quite a few uh, cantaloupe varieties, but um, he's been retired now, and he has not been replaced. So the university itself is not breeding right now for disease resistance. Um, there's a lot of work being done at private companies, and I, I think that in my it, what I've seen across the U.S. in terms of trends is that a lot of breeding work is now moving more into the private sector, sector and they they work very aggressively for um, on trying to develop lines that are that do have good disease resistance um, but the University itself University of Maryland is not um, we lost our our very good breeder and um, um, don't have a breeding program right now okay um, okay, so here's another question about um, food safety. I saw reports years ago that more handling led to greater bacterial numbers on melons, and she thinks it was with salmonella. Do you have any thoughts on that? So one of the reasons that's kind of cited for um, why we're seeing a much larger number of outbreaks associated, not just for with melons, but in general, with fruits and vegetables, we're seeing an increase in outbreaks and illnesses um, over time. And one reason, as I mentioned earlier, was, is because we have much better surveillance. But another reason could be, and I think this is very true, is because we have new products on the market that we didn't have before that are slightly higher risk, such as all these fresh cut, you know, ready to eat products that includes things like sliced up fruits, including melons and also pre-packaged salads, et cetera, et cetera. So the more, um, handling that occurs definitely increases the risk because every person, every contact surface, every utensil that comes in contact with that with that fruit or vegetable could pass on something new. And, you know, there's always a risk of foodborne path pathogen lurking somewhere that could get on. And then the longer it's stored um, at the supermarket and at home, again, that risk of those numbers increasing to a level that could make you sick also increases. So there is always that risk. If you buy your own and slice your own, you are minimizing that risk um, for sure. 
But, you know, of course, those products are not going away. And many of us have very busy lives that <laughs> we have to say those products are very convenient. So we can see that how people are probably eating a mixture of, you know, preparing at home versus pre pre prepared. Um, so we have to find ways to minimize that risk also, you know, through the supply chain. Okay. Um, we had a question about whether you were concerned about um, exposure for the applicators when you were doing that um, experiment that you showed the video of, of um, inoculating the soil with the, the bacteria. Were we concerned or not concerned? Were you concerned? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, so those yeah. bacteria were actually um, non-pathogenic. So okay. technically, we could have licked the nozzle and we should have been okay. <laughs> we don't recommend that to anybody. Uh, but you, if you remember, you, the, the Niana and Sasha who were applying the the inoculum in the field were wearing Tyvek suits. So we still um, take those precautions and they were wearing gloves. Um, and of course, everything gets sterilized after we use it, even okay. though... I said they're they're non pathogenic strains, so it really was not an issue with that. Okay, yeah, I think he was a little worried. Um, let's see. Um, do you have any thoughts about using um, trap crops for any of the diseases that you mentioned? Um, in terms of the um, um, plant diseases, yeah, I think the that's what um, about. yeah, so so that is a technique that has been used with. Um, some success for for insect pests, but for diseases, it's much more difficult to implement because they are spread in a different manner. So, um, the one the diseases that it might work for would be for insect-borne diseases, something like viruses. Um, and we did not see uh, significant virus pressure from, although. Can, uh, melons do get virus diseases, but we did not see those in this this trial. If we had, there might have been there might have been a way to have planted a border around um, so that the insects um, bearing those virus diseases would have fed on those and, and lost the virus before they reached the crop. But for the diseases that we saw, powdery mildew, downy mildew, and anthracnose, they're uh, they're Powder and downy are born in the wind, and they can go very long distances. They could they could definitely um, bridge over any kind of trap crop that you would have that, uh, um, and and make it to your your cash crop. So it wouldn't be effective. Okay, well, thanks for clarifying that, and um, thanks for everyone for asking questions. Um, so thank you so much, Kate and Shirley, for presenting your research today, and thanks for everyone for joining us.